I remember I went to an eating disorder conference where this desperate mom, you know, was asking at the end of the Q&A to this panel of experts. Basically, she said, look, my daughter is not in a good place. She's in college, does not have insurance to address this. How do I get help for her? He was silent from the panel of experts. G'day, and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Codgins. Today, we are talking with Veronica Lucioni, who is a mother with a daughter who went through anorexia. Following her daughter's recovery from anorexia, Veronica founded the Elephant in the Rune Foundation, a charity that aims to improve the lives of individuals with anorexia nervosa. She's on the show today to share her perspective as a mother having a child with anorexia and how she went about helping her daughter with her anorexia. Hello, Veronica, and welcome to Wellbeing. Hello, Jack. Before we begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Veronica? Before kids, I was an engineer by profession and an artist by passion. And I think I always have this duality in me. So I work professionally as an engineer, as an expert witness in geotechnical engineering. And I also um, did a lot of commissioned projects in photography and eventually even publish a book in photography. So I am now a happy mother of two adult children. Uh, my daughter is about to graduate this June, in fact, from Stanford University, and my son will be graduating next year from UCLA, so I couldn't be happier. <laughs> um, having said that, I'm a happy mother now, but that wasn't always the case, um, especially not during the time when my daughter suffered from anorexia. So in a nutshell, I think that um, that's who I am. When did you first start to notice that anorexia was becoming a bit of a problem for your daughter? Oh, geez, that's really hard to pinpoint um, because a lot of the things that she did actually blends in really, really well with a typical teenage behavior. And actually, it's a lot of things that we do ourselves at times. Um, I think the first time I started noticing was her making excuses to skip meals. She was in a swim team before, and after swim practice, she was... She would run up to her room and say, oh, I'm too tired to eat, Mom, and she just went to sleep. I didn't think of it much. Sometimes, yes, you are too tired to eat, and that's okay to go to sleep. Um, the next morning, she would get up, and she would be in a hurry to go to school and forget to eat breakfast. Um, you know, it's just that little thing. Um, but at the same time, I noticed that she took up an interest in food. She started collecting recipe books. She was obsessed about uh, baking, learning how to bake. And, you know, for weeks, basically, the whole family enjoyed this amazing baking in the family. And she was always serving the rest of us all her food. I mean, during meal time, she's always the one who's setting up the table, who serves everybody's food. She especially, um, I remember, pounding in so much food into her brother's plate and making sure that he ate all of it. Um, you know, I didn't really take notice that actually she wasn't eating at all. She was just constantly going back and forth, cleaning up the table, putting utensils, serving this and serving that, serving everybody's food. And little by little, I noticed that every time she ate, um, she always has this look in her face as if what in front of her looks so disgusting. I thought to myself, that's a bit weird. And then I started noticing she started cutting up all of her food into little pieces. I said, that's really weird, but, you know, that's okay. I mean, some people do that. I thought, you know, maybe she's just changing. Maybe she's just um, trying to see what her self is um, like as she's growing up. Um, and she became extremely picky about her food. That was quite concerning. And for me... Um, you know, I began to make her favorite food, like she likes pizza, she loves um, chocolate mousse. I made all of that, and she just didn't seem to respond to any of that anymore. Um, I thought that was really strange, because I remember my own sister, when she was a teenager, she went through this phase of dieting, and I remember one of her favorite foods was noodles, and she would not eat for a long period of time, but she would save that eating moment for her noodles. But I didn't see that in my daughter. She seemed to really not have any more favorite food. So that, I thought, hmm, that looks, that, that seems strange. Um, but at the same time, as she was, I could see that she started losing weight. She was super energetic. Um, 
in swim team, her time improved. She started running, and her running time was incredible. Um, at home, I thought, well, she hasn't eaten much, but my gosh, she would go up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs, making all kinds of excuses as if she needed to go up and down the stairs. Oh, I forgot my eraser. She would run up the stairs. Oh, um, I forgot my homework upstairs. She'd run up the stairs and go down. Um, so all of these things started happening, and um, I noticed that she kept her bedroom really, really, really cold. Um, before she ate anything, which she would just eat fruit, she would freeze the food. So she would only be eating frozen food. Um, you know, as time went on, I think she became more and more moody. Um, she was very nasty to to her own brother, which was not the case before. They used to be very good siblings. They played together. Um, but for me, I think the telltale was when she became out of character. She started to lie and blatantly to me. Um, I remember one time coming back from school, she made made up this story. She had a crumple of granola bar wrapper, and she was taking it out of her bag, and she was telling me, how, oh, I just ate, so I won't be hungry for dinner, Mom. Um, as she was telling me all these stories, I got close to her, and I could smell in her breath that this is someone who hasn't eaten for a while. So I asked her, did you really eat that granola bar? And she said, yes. Did you just ate it? And she said, yes. I call out on her, and I said, no, you did not. I said, I could smell it in your breath. You haven't eaten the whole day. Of course, she got really, really mad. She started screaming, yelling. And I think that was actually the very, very first time she realized it herself to that there's something not right because she's one of those very honorable persons before. She never lied. She always hated it when somebody lied to her. And all of a sudden now, she just got caught lying blatantly. A lot of other bizarre things as her body changed um, and she became skinnier, she started wearing smaller clothes. I mean, clothes that were supposed to be given to the charity because it was just old clothes and um, it's from two years back. She started fitting into those clothes again and she started wearing them. Um, so I told her, no, you cannot be wearing those. So, you know, you cannot be fitting into your smaller and small, smaller clothes. And as she becomes skinnier, weirdly enough, too, people start making comments about her, and she didn't like it. So she started wearing baggy clothes after that, trying to hide, you know, from looking skinny. Um, and later on, I think what what was really worrisome for me was uh, when she started to isolate herself from her friends. She not only not wanting to eat with them, she doesn't want to socialize with them. She's not smiling anymore. Oh, her hu- no more humor. Um, she used to be a very happy person, and all of a sudden she changed and she becomes this grim, lethargic um, person that still is going up and down the stairs and doing all of these sports. Uh, so that was, I think, um, all in all put together, you know, as a mother. At, at, at that time, I was a stay-at-home mother, so I was with her, and I was able to observe all of that. So at that time, I began to... Um, do something about it. Do you have any idea what might have brought it on? Um, well, I think it was through her understanding. I never actually passed on it at the time. Uh, to her understanding later on, you know, she said, well, you know, I actually, I don't know, I didn't mean to, you know, prompt all of these almost like reactions to her own body, but I just felt like, hey, I'm I'm growing up, you know, I'm I'm bigger than most of the kids and I want to just be healthier. So I, I do exercise and I watch what I what I ate and that's all. Um so for her that, that you know the lose the losing initial weight she came up with that story. Um, even though I could see it as when she lost weight, uh, it was the reaction from losing weight afterward, afterwards was truly is beyond her. Um, so that was you know, so bewildering to me, and that was, to me, was different to just a regular diet thing. There's something there. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Veronica Lucioni where we are talking about her journey in being the mother of someone with anorexia. When do you think the anorexia became severe and dangerous? With her, it wasn't uh, to the point of near death. 
because before she lost, you know, before she became completely like what you would think anorexic looked like, um, I think I intervened on time to make sure that she gained her weight. And I think that was that was the hardest thing um, for me to do because I don't think there is a common knowledge out there to, to alert you to intervene early. I remember specifically even the doctor themselves, you know, kind of played this game. Oh, well, all of her tests came out normal, so um, why don't we wait and see? You know, she's, a teen, she's about to become a teenager. She was 11 at the time. Um we we'll wait and see, and maybe she'll be okay. I mean, I had to put the doctor aside, and I actually insisted on her advising my daughter to make sure that she would want to gain weight. And the reason I did that was because um, I did my research on anorexia. I read all kinds of stories. I read all the scientific papers. And I was trying just to put the two and two together in terms of what the body of science knows and what's happening with my daughter at home. And um, what I realized was there seemed to be a mechanism that's not fully known by people that, um, you know, a scientist already found out about. So very fundamentally, anorexia is um, biological, the progression of it. Mm. And... um, and I think having that knowledge really helped me in terms of doing doing what needs to get done, which is for her, she needs to gain weight. You know, some people are just born with this genetic predisposition to anorexia, and mm-hmm. once it's triggered with weight loss, the only way to stop that mechanism and the only way to stop your body from starving is the weight gain itself. You know, I think... The status quo is still such that the status quo is still more on the control issue or they're saying, oh, it's a coping mechanism. And, you know, to me, it didn't make sense because my daughter was not coping with any problem. The losing weight and all of her other behavior was the problem. So it didn't make sense to me, um, all of these psychological um, issues that the status quo that was the root cause of anorexia. Um, it's uh, when I realized also that the effect of starvation is actually on the mind. You know, that, that effect of starvation, like her being nasty to her brother, that's one of them. You know, the fact that they become even more controlling. I think she became very, very anxious when it comes to eating. All of those were actually the effect of starvation. Any starving people would appear mentally ill like that. However, when it comes to anorexia, the status quo is still such that it's mistakenly taken all of the psychological effects from starvation as if they were the root cause, anorexia. So I think having learned that information was very, very vital for me so that, you know, I was able to convince her about what's going on with her, to convince her that waking is recovery for her. Because otherwise, she was happily doing her whereabouts. You know, she's still excelling in school. Um, she is still doing well in school. I mean, why would anybody believe that? Why would anybody believe that a smart person would starve themselves to death? You know, it didn't make sense. Mm. As a mother, while your daughter was going through anorexia, how did that affect you mentally? Oh, my gosh. That was really, really difficult. I think, um, you know, f- for me, I was exhausted mentally and physically on a daily basis. Physically and mentally because I was doing my research. At the time, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what anorexia was. I didn't know what's going on with my daughter. I didn't recognize her anymore. The fact that she became a liar and um, all of these odd things that that was happening defies logic. I mean, how could somebody who's starving do so well in sports? How could somebody who's starving is still getting A's at school? I mean, it just didn't make sense in this team. So, you know, 
you know, I did my study and I, I, I tried to put the two and two together. And at the same time, I didn't want to wait too long because from all the stories that I've read, you know, that weight gain is super important to turn somebody around. So at the same time, I had to convince her that that's the right thing to do. And at the same time, also making sure that she is gaining weight, that she is, she is actually eating and not normalizing her behavior, really. Her behavior of um, refusing to eat, her behavior of this obsessiveness about moving around, all of that. And um, if it wasn't, I say, for my friend, I, have, I was lucky enough to have a girlfriend who I confided with on a daily basis. And I have a group of girlfriends who check on me from time to time, who just supported me wholeheartedly. I don't think I would be, <laughs> I could have done what I did to help my daughter. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very, very difficult for me. You know, somehow, I think as a mother, I have this instinct within me. I don't know how to explain it, but I never forget um, why I was doing it and the fact that my daughter needed me and I was the only one who could help her. I mean, it was really like fighting a war by yourself, you know, for your daughter. I remember even my my husband at the time, you know, could not believe anything that I said. You know, for him, he was an athlete. He was very goal-oriented. So everything that my daughter was doing made sense to him. Yes, you diet, you train uh, to improve your performance. And that's exactly what my daughter was doing, and he didn't think there was anything wrong with that. He couldn't see that for him it was a choice and for her it wasn't and it was actually very dangerous for her. You know, my mental health, it was definitely challenged. So I think I was lucky in the fact that I took help, I welcome help to keep myself sane. Did the relationship with your daughter change as the anorexia got worse? Um, yes, it did. But it actually changed It was very, very challenging because she obviously was becoming a teenager. So there is part of her that wanted to fight and wanted to be independent. So we had plenty of discussion where I tried to elaborate to her that, yes, I know I should give you freedom to do everything else except when it comes to eating at the moment. Just because I I told her that I cannot allow her to lose any more weight. And the reason being is that, you know, without this weight gain, she could never be well, and there's something going on with you that you can't explain, I can't explain, that she couldn't explain, I couldn't explain either. So in the beginning, I think she had trust in me, so I was very, very glad that she did that. She trusted me to at least dictate her in terms of how much to eat, when to eat, and what to do and what not to do. Um, Having said that, it was very, very difficult because I actually had to take drastic measures like stopping swimming, making her stay at home. She loves school. So all of those, I think, affected our relationship in a way that every moment now become contentious. Even though at the end, you know, there are a handful of time where at night, basically, she whispered to me, thank you, mom. Um, and then the next day, the whole thing, you know, started all over again. So, yeah, the relationship was very, very challenged. And I think, you know, I, again, you know, I got lucky because she, she did understand that we are working together. I mean, she did understand because I shared with her all of the knowledge that I knew and the reason why we were doing things. For example, you know, we watched a documentary on recovery at the treatment center. It was very, very disturbing. Basically, all of these otherwise amazing girls, that was a documentary of four girls. These four girls who were highly functioning, they took away all of their freedom for the purpose for them gaining weight without actually even explaining to them why they needed to gain weight. So for my daughter, I explained to her, okay, that weight gain is super important, and now it's up to you. Do you want to do it at the treatment center, or would you like to do it with me at home? 
And so we agreed on doing it at home. And, you know, she explained to me, okay, I don't want you to be adding cream, to be adding fat when I'm not looking. You know, I want you to be honest. So I said, okay, fine. I'll be honest with you in terms of what I put into your plate. Because that was one of the strategies in the treatment center or what other parents would do. They would actually put in extra fat into, you know, the daughter's soup mm. so that they could gain weight. So that's something that we agreed on. We, we, we agreed on the transparencies. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Veronica Lucioni, where we are talking about her journey in being the mother of someone with anorexia. Before your daughter kind of un- undertook that recovery, did, did you find that she kind of retracted from like hanging out with friends or like doing fun things with people? Yes, definitely. I I noticed that was the reason why I felt like something um, was very very concerning because she was she's a very very social person. Um, I think in the beginning she avoided them because she didn't want to feel pressure to eat. Um, but towards the end, I just believe that it's just your body starving. When your body is starving, people isolate themselves. Just they just don't have the energy to, um, you know, to be kind to people, to be kind to yourself. So that was really disheartening for me to, to see that in her. But that also was one of the things that really prompted me into starting to do something more drastic, like stopping school. And um, eventually, as a, as a family, you know, I don't even have anybody over for dinner anymore. We stop vacationing just because all of the circumstances basically lead me to not being able to help her to eat properly and to make sure that she didn't lose any more weight. How long did the recovery last? From the time that I noticed she starts going downhill, I mean, it took, it was quite fast. I mean, she, um, she lost about, 25% of her weight within, I want to say, four to six months. Mm. And after that, took probably another year before she is at a, at a good level. Um, and it took another year so, um, before I think her kind of mood, her behavior, everything started changing and she was in a good place. But even then, I have to say that it took probably another two years before she truly understands this kind of like this mechanism that's very specific to people who are born with this genetic predisposition, which is basically this weight loss that triggers this adaptive mechanism. Um, with her, she didn't do it on purpose at times, even when she was well. For example, during finals, um, she didn't mean to skip meals, but I think her stress level or the fact that maybe she was growing at the time Actually, she has a deficit. She lost weight during that time. And once that happened, basically, she snapped into this, this same thing that she didn't want to eat. And she ran up and down, up and down the stairs even more so. And she started lying to herself again. Like, the whole process started again. And I think it took several times before she actually understood, oh, when that happens, I better stop. And I actually should sit down or ask mom to tell me how much to eat. So that, you know, that whole process, I think, took another at least two more years, even when she was already in a good place, to truly understand, you know, that whole mechanism of weight loss, which most of her friends were able to do, you know, figure something else different for her. And I tried to explain that to her, too. Look, you know, there is something uh, that you're born with, this genetic predisposition, because nine out of ten girls your age, they go on a diet, but this only happens to you. So there's something more fundamental to just dieting and to just live in this Western society where dieting is so accepted and it's an accolade. How much support is there for family members of people that do have anorexia? Oh, geez. Oh, I, it's nothing on the early intervention. And the early intervention, what I mean is that the stage before anorexia is medically diagnosed, but all the behavior and all the weight loss already started to take place. So, you know, this is the reason, too, why I started the Elephant in the Room Foundation, is to help people at this stage, where it actually makes the biggest difference. My daughter is able to thrive again in life without any permanent damage, and 
she is now living her full life, which is fantastic. Um, but in terms of support for the family member, siblings, I think siblings suffer. Um, my son did not get any attention anymore. Um, everything was in support of my daughter. And he, and he also got the bad part from my daughter because my daughter, if he's not in good mood, she would be attacking him. Um, but he understood that. I try to, I try to, um, to help him understand that, you know, this is a tough period for your sister and this is our turn to help her. And I think at the time he was only nine years old and at night, when we say good night, he used to always tell me, oh, mom, don't worry about me. Go, go, go upstairs, go upstairs and go, to, go help, you know, go help my daughter. So he, under, he understood that he was helping and um, I thank him profusely and all the time to make sure that he understood that he was appreciated. And, you know, in his own little way, I think he tried to help his sister. He adored his sister. So at the time, um, he just finished watching Invictus, which is a movie about Nelson Mandela. He tried to tell her, he said, um, you are a captain of your own soul and master of your own fate. So um, you can do this. <laughs> but of course, my daughter did not take it well. As You know, like I said, she no longer has humor and she just, wanting to be mean to him because she, she didn't feel well. You know, I think in his own way, he, he, he did try to help. And you know, in terms of support from extended family, that's a really difficult one. Even though they're very well intended, they don't really know what's going on. And I think because there's not that clarity in terms of what anorexia is about, they repeat what society understood anorexia is about. Um, I remember my father-in-law told me, and actually, which kind of upset me, he actually also told my daughter, hey, you know, um, you were a big girl before, and then now you lost this weight. You look good. You look good now. But don't lose any more weight. Uh, well, actually, you could gain a little bit more weight. That would make you look perfect. So this this focus on appearance and not encouraging her to... Um, to do what's best for her, which was mm -hmm. gaining more weight so that she could address this anorexia, wasn't there. So it was not helpful. Um, you know, in terms of the support um, from the internet, I mean, the internet is so confusing. It says in every website, early intervention is key, early intervention is key, but it never says what early intervention was. Mm. And um, I, I remember um, I went to an eating disorder conference where this desperate mom you know, was asking at the end of the Q&A to this panel of experts. Basically, she said, look, my daughter is not in a good place. She's in college, does not have insurance to address this. How do I get help for her? It was silent from the panel of experts. Mm. <laughs> and so it was, it, was, it was very, very disheartening for me to hear that when I felt like the answer is there. The answer is weight gain. You know, the trigger is weight loss. It is that biological, you know, the focus, the, this is this mistake of, you know, causes versus effects. The correlation is not causation. It is so rampant that people cannot see uh, what anorexia truly is about. When your daughter was going through that recovery and getting better, how did that feel for you to see her getting better? Oh, it was, um, it was very, very gradual very, very gradual, and it took a long time, and I don't think there was ever a time where you just say, oh, yay! Now hindsight, yes, but that's been so long. But during the process of it all, I don't think it was um, it was that obvious when you're actually there. Um, it, it, it was, you know, every step of the way, you want to support her. So the minute that she gained a little bit more weight and she feels better, um, you want to make sure that she doesn't stay at that stage because you know that she's not in a good place yet. Uh, I try to explain to her that, you know, biologically, after you starve yourself for that long, um, there's a secondary hunger hormone, this ghrelin, that's still circulating in your body. So you may feel like, okay, if I don't stop eating, I'm going to eat all the time, which was her worry, basically. She, when she started eating, I noticed that 
she was hungry, but she actually stopped herself. So I, I tried to explain to her, let that go. Try to understand this process. The fact that, you know, you will feel hungry and you feel like you want you you don't have this natural cue to stop yourself from eating. Therefore, um, you don't want to go there. And I say, trust me, you know, I'm your mother. I would, I will not let you become obese and, you know, have an, uh, develop a different problem. I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I made sure that I wanted her to be healthy and I emphasized that. Um, so I think having her understa- understand what was going on and the science behind it was super helpful. Now, the, um, the paper that was written that, under, uh, that underlies all the biological components and ge- the genetic components behind anorexia is a scientific paper. It was not easy. It was not an easy read. Um, but thankfully, um, she's a scientific person, and she's very academic, so she understood you know, all the different components. She understood what was going on biologically and genetically. Even with that understanding, <laughs> it was very, very hard for her to do it. And I think without the support, without me being there, without her trusting me, to help her guide through it, I think it was very, very difficult for her to be able to come out of it. Well, thank you for being on the show today, Veronica. Well, thank you, Jack. I mean, you know, we still have a long way to go, I think, from empowering anorexic. But I do believe that with education, every single anorexic could be my daughter, could be the story of success could thrive again. My guest today was Veronica Lucioni. Tune in next week when we speak with the sister of someone who has anorexia. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins, and all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.